Well, good morning, everyone. If we've never met, my name's TJ, pastor here at Refresh, and I'm thrilled that you guys are here. The real Christians show up on Time Change Sunday, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Don't tell the other people I said that. But they're going to show up at the end of service. They'll be like, oh, I forgot. I'm, I'm just playing. Uh, today, we are kicking off a brand new series called On Purpose, because you were created on purpose and with a purpose. Like there's, there's a reason for your being. And one of the things I love to preach the most out of all the things that I could possibly preach in all the world and all of scripture is this purpose. Because purpose has played such an incredibly huge part of my life. You see, when I was growing up, uh, I didn't know what I was supposed to do with my life. Anybody else kind of feel that way ever, right? Maybe you feel like that's today, that today's the day, right? Going through high school, there's a little bit of pressure. You got to declare a major before you ever get to college, right? You got to find your path, got to go where the school is, it has all the, right? And, and so I took some time, I, I thought about it. I found a school, I was a rower in high school, so I found a college that had scholarship for rowing um, and it had the major that I decided, well, this one sounds good enough, naval architecture, right? And so I did my, naval architecture, I'm not, I never went there to do that, but would not have been useful here in Idaho, I just tell you that much. But I grew up in Florida, where there's a lot of boats uh, for all of that. So I had this dream. I had this dream. I was going to go, you know what? I'm going to go design incredible things, make a whole bunch of money, and avoid as many people as possible. <laughs> and here I am today. But that, my purpose wasn't a very good purpose. Like, like, how many of you know, like, having good, nice things is not bad at all. But it's not a purpose. Like having a nice house is not a purpose, it's just a perk. Have, having, I wanted a yacht. Anybody ever like, when you were a kid, you're like, yacht, I want a yacht. Come on, back row people. Mm. Yeah. Some of y'all grew up in like the middle of the United States and you can tell. You never dreamed of a yacht. You're like, no, cabin though, lots of cabins, lots of cabins in their room, okay. Yeah, mountain, whatever, okay. So, but that, that's, that's where I was. I, I was like, I'll do this thing and I want that and I want, but that's not a purpose until one day I went to a camp. I graduated high school. I was 18 years old. I went to camp and I just had an encounter with God. And then on a mission trip the very next week. And at that two week span, God began to work something in my heart and it was purpose. Because I had nothing I was living for except for my own wants. But when I got purpose, it changed the way I looked at everything. And so I was down in Little Havana in Miami. I walked across Calle Ocho, and I picked up a payphone at Lizzie's laundromat, and I put my quarter in, because we didn't have cell phones, because I'm a little older than some of the people in the room. And I was, yeah, anyway, I put the quarter, a payphone is, you put a quarter in, <laughs> And you, you punch numbers. It's like a regular phone, but it has a cord and it only works with money. Like change, right? And that's when it was still a quarter. And I picked it up and I called my house and I called my parents. And they didn't answer. So the answering machine picked up. The, the tape kind. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody else? <laughs> like I, I'm, I was born in the 80s. You know, like this is how we do things. And I left a, a message. Hey, guys. Things are going well on the missions trip. I um, decided I'm not going to take that full ride scholarship that I got, and um, I'm going to become a pastor instead. Thanks, bye. <laughs> when I came home, boy, was there a conversation. They talked with me. They tried to talk it, me out of things. They set up a meeting with the pastor of the church. Like, they're like, you cannot do this. You're ruining your life. And I'm like, for the first time, I found life. For the first time ever, I feel like I have something to live for. Purpose changes things. And did I have to change? Sure. I had to ask God to change my desires. Because when a pastor has a yacht, people start asking questions. <laughs> my shoe came untied. I'm sorry. While I'm down here, these are new shoes. So if you guys want to heat on the feet, fire in the soul. That's preachers right there, okay. But I had something to live, I finally, I was like, this is something I can actually live for instead of just trying to f 
find the next best thing after I gained the last next best thing. And how many know when you gain the next best thing, you're not satisfied, are you? But purpose moves you. It changes you. It makes you wake up different. It makes you go to bed different. It makes you make decisions different. Purpose is powerful. And so it is my favorite thing in the world to talk about because it changed my life forever at the age of 18. And I felt the call to go into ministry. Now, that's not the only purpose out there, but that was mine. Some of you guys, your purpose is totally different. Chase it and run after it. But the best way to have a good sense of purpose is to understand who you are in Christ. I don't know about you, I, I've, I've spent large portions of my life wondering if I will ever measure up. If, I, if, I, if there's like the measuring stick of, of humanity, I always felt like I was kind of just a little bit short. Anybody else ever do that? Yeah. And, and some of you guys, you're like, I'm not even going to raise my hand. I don't feel like I'm worthy of that. When I was younger, I, I had a, tw- a sister younger than me, 20 months younger than me. And uh, how many know girls grow faster than boys? Yeah, so she was taller than me for a while. The older brother, shorter than the younger sister. Talk about a complex, right? Like, I didn't feel like I measured up. You go to the roller coasters at the amusement park, and she gets to get on because she's taller, and you're like, I'll hold your purse. You know, like, just, (laughs) it's just not fair, man. Genetics, you know, now I'm like way taller, so I'm good now. (laughs) Just bitter a little bit. But when you look at yourself as not measuring up, you're never going to really understand your purpose. You, know, you, you, you see yourself as unqualified from day one. You're never going to say yes to the purpose God calls and you, because you're going to go, you might say, God, you're making a mistake. <laughs> you were supposed to talk to the other TJ. You're supposed to talk to the other good-looking person across the room. You guys say that to God? Because you're the good, okay, whatever. I'm going to keep moving. <laughs> Romans chapter 12. Look at, look at what Paul writes. He says this, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Romans 12, three, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather, rather do this. Think about yourself with sober judgment. What what does he mean by sober judgment? Sober judgment means you're looking at your own life properly. You're looking at your life in a healthy way. You're not thinking of yourself too highly. I'm the man, you're blessed by my presence. You're lucky to be friends with me. My wife is lucky she married me. She said yes to my, you know, like, you're like, that's that's a little prideful, right? Like, you're you're not going to get very far like that. But also the other end of it is just as destructive. So so Paul tells him, look look at yourself through sober judgment, with with eyes that are clear, not not hazy, not, not polluted by our past, by the things that our second grade middle, second grade, uh, uh, Math teacher, that was the word I was looking for. Second grade math teacher said about us. Not the things that our coach said we could never be. Not the things that our parents never gave us, but the sober judgment of what God says about us. And when you begin to walk in that, it changes everything. Look at the end of the verse. In accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. God has given you faith. So look through the lens of faith when you look at the future of your life, when you look for the calling in your life, when you look for the purpose in your life. Do not look through the can'ts and won'ts and never will be's that have been deposited in your life, but look through the eyes of faith of what God has for you because you will never get right until you see right. You're never gonna get to that purpose until you understand that there's a God calling you to it. And so we're gonna change our point of view today. Can you guys do that with me? We're we're, going to ask three questions. We're going to change our point of view on how we're seeing our future in him. And so proper perspective starts with these questions. Uh, I'm going to go to the book of Judges, chapter 6, verse 11. And this introduces us to a guy named Gideon. Have you ever heard of Gideon before? Gideon is an Old Testament character. And at this time in the Israelite history, they had no king. They had become free from Egypt by the mighty hand of God, led by Moses into the promised land. Moses, dead. Joshua, his successor, dead. Now, Israel has no king, but they're being ruled 
by judges. God is their king, and the judges mediate between people. And so the time of the judges is around, and in this season, the Israelites have rejected God. The God who delivered their ancestors from Egypt, they go, uh, we'll try all these other gods too. The Baals and the Asherahs and all that. And as a result of them leaving God, they left his blessing. And for seven years, the Midianites would come in and just ravage the land. They would come in and they would destroy all the crops. They would kill all of their farm animals. They would do everything they could to keep Israel in absolute destitute, destitution and poverty. And so the Israelite people were forced. They couldn't live out on the plains where they could grow their crops because the Midianites were just destroying it again and again. So they lived among the mountains and in the caves and they tried to grow in small spaces so that they could survive. And that's the environment we find Gideon. And it says this in verse 11, then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah. Not Oprah, Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer, Abizir. You guys get it, right? Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. So Gideon is lucky enough to have some grain. It grew, they harvested it, but now he needs to thresh the grain. Now, I don't know, I, I had to look this up. I'm not a farmer. Any, you guys might know what threshing is. I don't know. And so I had to look it up. And threshing is when you break the kernels apart and you throw it in the air and the wind blows the lighter stuff away and what falls down is what you keep. And it's traditionally done on a threshing floor, which has a place where it's out in the open where the wind can blow through freely so that when you throw it up, the, re- the lighter stuff blows away and the heavy seed, the part you want, falls to the ground. And so all that is left, the end, is what you want. Now, Gideon is afraid of the Midianites. So he's not out on the open on the threshing floor. He's actually in a wine press, which is a hole in the ground where they would press the wine or press the grapes to get the wine, right? So he's, he, he's down in a hole. And I don't know about you, when I read the Bible, I always read it sort of with a sense of humor. So I'm, I'm imagining he's like down in this little hole and, and he's got this grain and he's looking around and he just throws it out of the hole and waits for it to fall. And if it was like the opening scene of a movie, the first thing you would see is just like a level ground shot and grain just shooting up out of the ground. And you got to be going, what on earth is going on here? It's just Gideon. <laughs> I just don't, I'm afraid. He's so afraid. He's literally hiding in a hole in the ground. And then... And then the angel shows up to him there. And before I get to the angel's uh, uh, questions that he has, uh, I, I got to ask a question of you. So here's Gideon in the hole, full of fear. How do you think God sees you in those circumstances? Have, have you ever been in those circumstances? Like there's a fearful part of your life that you're, you're literally hiding from the world and it might not be a physical thing, but it might be an emotional or spiritual or a broken thing on the inside of you. And you find yourself down in the hole emotionally. I hope they don't see it. I hope nobody discovers this part of my life. I bet you've been there just like me, haven't you? Where we're just kind of hiding the broken parts of who we are. I believe that the fear in our life, the things that we're most afraid of, the things that we're hiding the most, are usually the things that are most intertwined with our purpose and our destiny. I, I didn't tell you, but when I felt called to go into the ministry, I was like, God, that's awesome. Thank you for this, I think. How about I'll be the guy that does the budgets and shuffles the papers around and like cleans the facility. I don't know. Like, just don't make me get in front of people because there is a fear inside of me. I think there's large parts of our life that are fearful, that are intertwined with our destiny, that are intertwined with our purpose. And I'm sure if you've discovered your purpose at some point in your life, you've understood that that's true. That you're saying, I don't know how, or I could never, and God's going, oh, that's exactly where we're going. That's your, we're gonna go there. So the question is, how does God see you? How, how did this angel of the Lord look down at Gideon? How did he see him fearfully hiding in the press? 
It says this in Judges chapter 6, verse 12. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Again, I read the Bible with a sense of humor. And so I see the angel looking at the guy hiding in the hole in the ground going, Mighty hero, I've been looking for you. God is so with you right now. It does, he doesn't look the part, does he? Do you look the part? Do you look the part of mighty hero? Do you look the part of God is with me? Look at my life. Do you look the part? God sees you that way. Even when we're cowering in the worst parts of our fear, he's like, man, there's something inside of you that I see. God is with you. God is stirring something in you. God has put that, that part of you together and the enemy's trying to make you so afraid of it that you could never do anything about it. Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. He speaks life and hope into the darkest places of his life. Look at, look at what the uh, first Peter says in the New Testament about you. He says this, you are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. He's, he's speaking to people that are followers of Jesus. He says, you're not just a person. You're actually royal priests. Oh, TJ, I'm not good enough to be a priest. Guess what? That's what he calls you. No, but if you knew my life and the things and I'm hiding in this wine press and I'm not that kind of person. Well, God says you are. That's good enough for me, right? Is that good enough for you? Like all of us are in the ministry. All of us are called a holy nation. All of us are his holy possession, right? And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. He's calling you out of the darkness of the holes in the pits in your life. He's calling you out going, mighty hero, there's so much more for you. Royal priesthood, come on out here. I've set you apart for this thing. And in that good news, you guys are going, well, I didn't have my cup of coffee yet, so I think it's good news. <laughs> but I promise you, it's good news. Even if you do not see yourself that way, that's how God sees you. So when you're wondering what your future holds, I believe, I believe it's for something incredible. And it may not be, hey, I'm going to change the entire world with my life incredible, but the kind of incredible that impacts the person beside you in an incredible way that changes their destiny forever and changes those people over there forever. And the course of the lineage of your family line has changed forever. That kind of incredible. When you see yourself the way he does. The, the second question I have for you guys is how do you see God? This is Gideon. He, he's like, it's clear. The angel of the Lord goes, hey, you're a, you're a hero. God is with you. You're, there's so much in front of you. God has incredible things. And then Gideon's response tells us how he sees God. And how he sees God is, well, He's not ever going to get right until he sees right. And look how he sees. Judges chapter 6, verse 13 continues. Sir, Gideon replied, if, don't you always hate it when somebody's like ifing you? If the Lord is with us. You notice, you notice the tense change there? Like, like God is with you. And he's like, well, if God is with us. He's changing the subject a little bit, isn't he? Maybe, maybe right now, like I, I, I stepped on a sore spot of the fear points in your life and you're like, well, what about this over here instead? Anybody else do that? You're in church or you're reading the Bible and you're like, well, that's great for them. But I don't know if it's good for me. If God, why, why is, if God is, the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. He is, he is bringing everybody into his fear. He's bringing everybody into his problems. He, misery loves company, right? Man, aren't we really quick to share the pains of life? We're like, you'll never believe what that person said about me. Ah, oh, this, this thing over here hurt you. I'm not ever going back to that church or that workplace or that person or what, whatever the case is. Our wounds and our fears, 
they spill over into the world around us. And that's Gideon. And, and honestly, he's treating God like he's distant. He's treating God like he's an unknown commodity. He's treating God like he doesn't care. But God obviously does. He found Gideon hiding in a wine press just to tell him, I believe in you. And Gideon's like, yeah, right. <laughs> Have you ever told God, yeah, right? Maybe right here in this moment, I've been saying this whole thing like God has a plan for you. He has a destiny for you. And you're going, yeah, right. I don't think so. That has less to do with God and more to do with how you see God. Because he's got a plan. He's got a dream. He's got a destiny. He's got everything for you. Whether you accept it or not is not on him. That's on you. And that's on Gideon. Look, in contrast, look at the way David writes about God. So, so Midianites are like, he's like, oh my gosh, God, you've abandoned us. Oh my gosh, Gideon's saying all these things. Why have you been far from us? Look at David, the man who, who constantly was under siege and attack. Look what he writes in the book of Psalms. He says this, you are my strength. I wait for you to rescue me. To you, oh God, are my fortress. You, oh God, are my fortress. In his unfailing love, my God will stand with me. David was under just as much pressure, just as much oppression and attack throughout the course of his life. And he goes, yet I will still stand on the rock of my God the fortress of who he is. I love that song, Firm Foundation, don't you? Man, I've got a firm foundation. Even, even though I want to crawl under the firm foundation into the wine press and hide away from life, I still know that he's stronger than anything else. And if I stand there, something special is happening. Amen? Amen. First, or Second Corinthians, in the New Testament, Paul talks about a weakness, a brokenness in his own life. He's pretty candid at what God said to him. He's saying, I'm broken. I don't know if I have what it takes and all these things. Will you, will you take this suffering away from me? Look what God responds. He says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Well, if his power works best in weakness, I've got all the weakness he can handle, right? which means all the power available from God on high is available to me. Because if all it takes is weakness, handled, right? Like we can do this. And so look at Paul's response. He says this, so, so now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults and the hardships and the persecutions, and the troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul looks at God from the wine press of life. When God says, mighty warrior, he goes, God, I don't know if I have what it takes, but if you say it, I believe it. If you say you want to use my weakness, well, I offer it all to you now. How about you? I know all of us have plenty of weakness and brokenness to share, right? More than our fair share of it. And we can definitely use that for Christ, can't we? And he says, and that's exactly what I want to do in you. I want to take all the things that are in you and I want to actually use those for my glory. I want to take all the brokenness of where you've been and turn it into his miracle, his story, your calling and your purpose. That's good news, right? I love it. So, so how does God see you? He's like, you're awesome. I'm with you. How does Gideon see God? I don't believe it. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Look all around. Then the third question is this. How do you see yourself? And your response to question number two, how you see God, is almost always determined by this question by how you see yourself. Because if you see yourself as a nothing and a nobody from nowhere and God could never or would never love someone like me, that's how you see him. But if you say, you know what, I'm not perfect, but my God died for me on the cross and he loves me no matter what, through all of my brokenness and heartache, it changes everything about the way you see your world and the way you see your life. And I love that. Look at how Gideon sees himself. Uh, we're going to go to verse 14. 
Then the Lord turned to him and said, I love this, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. Mighty hero. I don't think so. Get out of the pit and go. Go in the strength you have. Some of you this morning, you're going, TJ, I don't don't have much strength. That doesn't matter. If you have any strength whatsoever, that's all he requires. He doesn't ask Gideon to perform miracles. He doesn't ask Gideon to move mountains. He says, just go in what you have and I'll do the rest. That's good, isn't it? Do do you have even a little bit of something somewhere in your life that you could just go, God, it ain't much, but it's yours? Go in that and save the world. That's what he's telling the Gideon. Go go deliver from the Midianites. If I was a cheesier preacher, I'd say, you know, you have natural and he brings the super. You've got the ordinary and he's got the extra, right? But I'm not a cheesy preacher, so I'm not going to say that. Look at, look at Gideon. God's like, I'm sending you. Go in the strength you have. But Lord Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least in my entire family. He's saying, like, my entire clan, my tribe is the weakest of all of this. And of this, this little tribe right here, my my, my clan, my family is the lowest of them. And of my family, I'm the skinniest little dude. You, not, you do not want me out on the battlefield, God. Can't you see I'm hiding for a reason? You know, like I don't have it. I don't have what it takes. And I love how the angel of the Lord completely ignores everything he says. He says, I'll be with you. That, 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 Gideon's like, but I'm so unqualified. I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know how to do this, and I'm so weak. And he goes, I'll be with you. I'm unqualified. Here's the qualifier. Me. You have me. You don't have to go with any of your own strength. What you do have, run, go, do. But I'll do the rest. You got me, and I will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Don't you just love how God looks at him and speaks life into him. And he makes mistakes and he's like, nope, you're, you, no excuses here. Go in the strength you have. But I'm so weak. Ah, that's okay, because I'm going to be with you. He just answers every question. And maybe you walked in this morning and you're like, I don't know what church is going to bring today and I hope it's, hope it's good enough or short or whatever, I'm tired, what, whatever. My hope today, though, is that when you came in, you didn't have purpose, but today you've decided I'm going to find it. And all the excuses that have popped up in your head and in your mind and in your life, all of that, God's going, just go in the strength you have. I'm with you. You're a mighty warrior. And I pray that by the end of today, you believe what God says about you. Because he did not send his son so that you could just exist in the fear, in the trepidation, in the brokenness of this world. Listen, sin... It destroys everything. Like, why is Gideon hiding in a wine press? It's because sin ruins everyone's life. Brokenness is everywhere, right? Does that mean God can't redeem it? No, not at all. He says, if you take that brokenness and you give it to me, and you go in the strength you have, we're going to do something with this. Gideon was far from perfect, and we're going to continue the next couple weeks in the story of Gideon, and you'll see. He's not really a man of faith. <laughs> He's like actually the opposite. He is the most reluctant follower of God in almost all of the Old Testament. He's like, are you sure? And God's like, yeah, I'm sure. And he goes, but can you show it? Okay, he proves it. And he goes, okay, could you show me one more time? Oh, that's great. Um, not to be rude, but could you show me one more time? He keeps doing it. He keeps asking the questions again and again and again and again. Listen, faith is faith, even if it's small, even if it's slow. Is still faith. So go in the strength you have. One more verse for you today, and this is a verse that has spoken volumes over my own heart for years and years and years. And it's this, for God 
has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but a power in love and self-discipline. The fear that you're feeling is not from God. The timidity that has been holding you hostage, he never gave that to you. The brokenness of sin has hurt our world. But what did he give you? He gave you power, his power. He gave you love, his love. And he gave you the strength to be self-disciplined in the calling that he's given you. So all of us have fear. All of us have timidity. All of us have parts of our life, whether it's external or internal, that we are struggling with hiding in the wine press of life. But God never asked you to live there. And he's never told you to stay there. All he's ever done is said, give me that fear and I wanna give you so much more in return. I want to give you power. I want to give you my love. I want you to live beyond this. But you have to say yes to the purpose. And I believe every single one of us have purpose. I don't believe you were created on accident. I don't think that's the kind of God you serve. That you have a destiny and a, something that he wants to put in your heart. So what's the next step, right? Well, a couple things we can do. One, if you know your purpose, do not grow weary in doing good. Keep on trucking. <laughs> if you don't know your purpose, maybe today you just need to take some time to reflect, go, God, I don't know what it is. I've been hiding in the wine press and uh, maybe my fear is tied to my destiny and show me, Lord, I wanna know. And start discovering who you are. Discover your gifts, discover your talents, discover your abilities. That's why we teach our discovery class is just give people some tools to work with on how they can start to map out what God has for them, start to discover that. Or some of us, we don't really have a relationship with God. We're like, I don't, I don't really know God that he would even have a purpose for me. He doesn't speak to me that way because I don't know him. I don't have a relationship with him. If that's you, today's your day to say yes. Today's your day to go, you know what? I don't understand everything, but I know one thing. What I've been doing and where I've been, it's like the wine press. It's fearful, it's broken, and I'm hiding. And if on the other side of that is power and love and self-discipline, I'm in. If that's you this morning, we're gonna pray a prayer in a moment and it's simple. And I'm just gonna ask you guys to close your eyes and bow your heads with me and we're gonna pray. So all across this room, can you just take a moment? And I only ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads just so there's no distractions, no one moving around, no. Nothing like that. I just want you to listen for the voice of God. And today, some of you, you're getting purpose. For some of you, God is refining purpose. And for some of you, he's just saying, I wanna know you. I wanna start the conversation with you today. If that's you, I'm gonna pray a prayer and there's nothing special in the words that I pray, but there's something incredible that happens when you speak to him. And you can pray something like this, Father, today I surrender everything I am to you. You first and foremost are everything to me. And so I surrender everything I am. I wanna leave behind fear, brokenness and sin. I ask you to forgive me and bring me new life and power and love and self-discipline. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Everybody says, Amen.